What's up and welcome to episode of Gizmo Slip Tech. Today we're taking a look at the Aorus 17G. This is Aorus's mostly portable, high performance gaming laptop. You can equip this with an RTX 2070 Super Max Q or an RTX 2080 Super Max Q, depending on how much you wanna spend and what kind of performance you wanna get. We have the RTX 2070 version here. Now the thing that makes this laptop special is that it is a CNC milled unibody chassis. It's really, really sturdy. Very impressive build quality overall from Aorus this year. Better than the previous iterations of Aorus that I've seen in the X5 and the X7, both of which I have owned. I've had literally zero issues with those notebooks personally, even after many years of use. So I am personally pretty impressed with the Aorus lineup in general, at least no major issues. Now the other major feature for this machine that you typically don't see on gaming notebooks is the mechanical keyboard with deep travel and take a listen to this keyboard for a second. Pretty awesome sounding keyboard if you love mechanical keyboards. Now let's go ahead and take a brief look at the specs of this machine. We've got an i7-10875H with an RTX 2070 Super Max Q GPU, 512 gigs of storage, 16 gigs of RAM. It weighs just a little over six pounds in our measurement, 6.05 pounds to be precise, which is only point one pounds more than what Aorus rates it as. Now, as far as upgradability is concerned, you have two memory modules, both of which are very easily accessible. If you want to upgrade the storage right out of the gate, you have a free NVMe SSD slot available. Now, previously, Aorus had been selling this laptop for about $2,400, but recently, Aorus has dropped the price down to $2,099. The primary reason why they're charging that much for an RTX 2070 is, of course, the CNC aluminum chassis, as well as the mechanical keyboard. And another thing to note, is that the mechanical keyboard does have per key individually lit RGB keys if you want to manually set the colors, which of course costs additional money. So know that yes, you can get some RTX 2070 laptops for a little bit cheaper, probably around $1,600 is where a lot of the RTX 2070s lie right now, but to get an RTX 2070 Super is pretty close to the average cost nowadays. Now the ports on this machine are quite extensive. On the left side, we have two USB-A's, a headphone and microphone port, full-size SD card slot and an ethernet port, as well as a left side exhaust. On the back, we have two exhausts on either side, but the whole back has no ports on it. On the right side, we have another USB-A, a USB-C with Thunderbolt 3, which is quite nice if you wanna use an eGPU in the future, but it sadly does not support USB-C charging. And then we have a mini display port, an HDMI port, and of course the power adapter port, which I do not love the placement of this power adapter port. Being on the right side, that's also the side where I'm gonna be using my mouse quite a lot. And given if you have the power plug like this, it blocks all the ports right along that side when you have it plugged in, which means of course you have to have the power plug going backwards if you're gonna want to use those ports, which kind of limits how you're gonna be able to plug in the laptop. Not a big deal, just a small downside to point out there. Now Aorus claims this weighs 5.95 pounds, but we measured it at 6.05 pounds, just slightly more than what they said, and that's fine. Now this machine comes in at one inch thick, which means it's gonna be a little bit thicker than some of those ultra portable 17 inches like the GS75 Stealth, and also likely a little bit heavier than some of the competition out there. Now the 17.3 inch display is a 240 hertz with 343 nits brightness, which is above average. Now I measured the color gamut at 91% sRGB and 75% Adobe RGB, which is a little bit above average for most gaming laptops right now. And I measured the contrast at 1050 to one, which again is slightly above average. So the display here is pretty close to the average 300 hertz display, but it's just a little bit brighter and a little bit better color gamut, a little better contrast, just minor upgrades there. Now in my mind, the ideal gaming display is a 1440p, 400 nits, 144 hertz refresh rate minimum. So this is close. And of course, I would also love to see 100% Adobe RGB, but we're not there yet. Hopefully in the near future, we're gonna see some gaming laptop displays that have a little bit higher brightness and color gamut while maintaining their refresh rate. Let's talk more about the keyboard here. This is a very interesting keyboard. It has very good depth to it. And of course, being a mechanical keyboard, it is very clicky with a lot of tactile response. And some people out there are gonna absolutely love that. For me, I tried it out and I, I really liked it right away. That said, the layout to me is still not ideal. This is the same layout that Oris has been using on their laptops all the way back 
to like the Oris X5 from like four years ago that I owned. So this layout I think could use a lot of improvement. That said, it's still very functional. I think the biggest thing they can improve on the keyboard layout is if they moved the arrow keys down about an inch and then spaced out the numpad about a half inch further to the right, that would allow for more separation and more understanding of what keys you're pressing. Now we do have a dedicated numpad as well as dedicated home and page up and page down keys, which I really liked. And the backlighting on the keyboard is quite bright. You can still see it in a well lit room, which is really nice. Now the trackpad is smooth, tracks really well, very functional with good drivers, no issues there. It also has a fingerprint sensor in the top left, which I did use and had no issues having it recognize my finger consistently over, I don't know, like the 15 or so times I used it during this review. Now Oris has very minimal bezels on the top right and left, though the bottom bezel is still quite large. The webcam is in fact located next to the power button and it does have a privacy shutter, which I really, really like. Now because it is located lower, it, people call this a chin cam because you kind of have a lower angle when using the webcam, which may bother some, but not others, depending on your preference. Now the battery life on this machine is supposed to be quite good, supposedly eight hours. This says 94 watt hours up to eight hours of battery. In my experience, I did not get close to that anytime I was using the battery. Now this laptop is supposed to feature GPU switching where it turns off the Nvidia GPU and switches to the Intel GPU for lighter load and lighter or battery drain. But as far as I could tell, the Nvidia GPU was not turning off, constantly draining the battery, even when I was trying to go into power saver modes and, and stuff like that. So now after about an hour of fiddling with it, trying to get Nvidia Optimus to work correctly, I could not, and I just kind of gave up on it. Now, by the time any of you get the laptop, maybe there will be improved drivers already released, which fixes the Nvidia Optimus issue that I am dealing with here. So keep in mind, my battery run times does not include GPU switching, and if you get GPU switching to work for you, the battery run times will be dramatically better. For my web browsing, I only got about two and a half hours as well as streaming. I also got about two and a half hours while gaming about an hour and 15 minutes and airplane mode with max power savings is about three to three and a half ish hours. Kind of depends on how you optimize it. In my mind, it's a big bummer that the GPU switching was not working because that kind of holds it back in terms of portability potential. That said, a lot of laptops out there have GPU switching issues and it's just a matter of getting all the drivers set up properly because I did email Oris about the GPU switching issue and they did say that this should have it included on this specific model. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at some benchmarks and stress tests. Here we go. Starting off, we have the power limits for this machine. Now these first two graphs are the CPU and GPU power limits during a dual load stress test. 62 watts of power to the CPU is quite good. And of course, 89 watts of power is what I would expect for a max Q GPU. Now the interesting thing here is that we're getting the exact same power limits when applied to a CPU only render, resulting in good performance whether you're gaming or rendering for the CPU. Taking a look at some 1080p gaming benchmarks, Red Dead Redemption 2 on Ultra, we got 58 frames per second. That's right in line with what I would expect. Uh, Red Dead Redemption on low, 112, that's really good. So just know that with some modern games, you're gonna struggle to push 60 frames per second. Now, Valorant on Ultra, I got about 220 FPS. And The Witcher 3, 101, which was really good. Far Cry 5, 104. Tomb Raider 94, so overall we've got really solid performance coming out from the Aura 17G, about what I would expect for an RTX 2070 Super Max Q, right in line. Taking a look at 3D Mark Time Spy graphics, we got 7559, which is about what a RTX 2070 non Max Q gets. You can see that we got 7700 and 7800 on those two RTX 2070s non-max Q. Uh, that said, this did outperform the RTX 2070 Super Max Q in the GS66 Stealth. So this is basically right in line with what I would expect for a max Q variant of this GPU. Our 3D Mark times by points per pound, we're in the middle of the pack because this is a slightly thicker machine. And of course we don't have an RTX 2080 in here, just a 2070 Super. Now, 
For our points per dollar, we're right in the middle of the pack again because we're paying a little bit extra compared to some other machines that do not have a CNC aluminum chassis and mechanical keyboard. Again, those things cost a few hundred dollars extra. But overall, still pretty good bang for the buck for a GPU performance, just not fantastic if you're on an extreme budget. Now for our Cinebench R20 multi-score, we got a score of 3261 without any undervolting. Now if we had been able to undervolt it, we probably would have got a couple hundred points higher. So see the uh, GS66 Stealth, got 3483 probably would get a pretty similar score if we managed to undervolt now there may be a way to unlock undervolting in the bios but i didn't ask oris and i didn't dig around in the bios too far so maybe but either way it doesn't really change the fact that intel's processors really aren't that great at rendering what they're great at is gaming and so you're still got a great gaming processor in this machine and of course the processor is an eight core processor which allows it to do a lot of rendering as well if you need it to it's just not top top tier when it comes to rendering you can see on points per dollar we're about average and then for our handbrake 4k render time we got 10 minutes and 38 seconds which is not fantastic again because this is an intel processor and we could not enable undervolting so we did a dual load heavy stress test with the heaven benchmark and the firestrike physics cpu test and we got some pretty interesting results now when it comes to idle fan noise even in quiet mode this thing makes a little bit more noise than i would expect so expect a little bit of noise at all times with this machine. In normal fan mode and gaming fan mode, the fans is actually very reasonable at 46.7 decibels. That's very, very quiet considering you're still basically getting full performance from the machine. And then for a gaming fan, we got 51 decibels. That's also very good overall for a gaming fan mode where you're having increased fans and increased performance with reduced temperatures. As far as a max fan goes, this thing gets very, very loud at 59 decibels. So know that max fan is very, very loud on this machine. Now taking a look at our temperatures, you can see that we got a range from 69 degrees to 83 degrees, depending on which mode we're in. In the normal mode, we have the highest temperatures, but we only have a fan noise of 46 decibels. So if you're okay with a little bit higher temperatures and you want the machine to be quiet while you're gaming, that's a great trade-off for having overall quieter machine. That said, if you don't care about noise and you want the best temperatures, the best temperatures were actually pretty good with max fan enabled, 69 degrees on the GPU and 82 degrees Celsius for the CPU. And that's at max stress and at 62 watts of power to that CPU. So I'm overall impressed with the thermals that this machine puts out. That said, they're still not like super, super great. And I, I would mainly attribute that to the fact that we don't have that many heat pipes on the inside. Taking a look at the power profile performance, we're getting great all around performance in all of the power profiles for the GPU. But with the CPU, we're getting massively throttled in the quiet mode with a slight throttle in the normal mode down to 3.2 gigahertz. But for the gaming fan and max fan, we're getting roughly the same performance at 3.5 gigahertz. Now, one thing that was really interesting to me is if you take a look at the power limits that you got in quiet mode and in gaming mode with max fan, we actually had the GPU power limited to about 80 watts of power when it was set to 90 watts of power with the other two power profiles. But interestingly enough, the actual clock speed of the GPU did not change that much. Take it for what you will, just know that the power limit on the GPU does change depending on which power profile you're on. Now in Far Cry 5, you can see that we got right where I would expect for an RTX 2070 Super, 104 frames per second, solid performance. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, 94 frames per second. Again, right where I was expecting it, right next to the GS66 at 96 frames per second with the same GPU and CPU combo. Now when it came to speakers, the speakers in this machine are above average. They do sound pretty good with reasonable fullness and bass overall solid set of speakers on here nothing amazing but it was like a solid like 8 out of 10 speaker experience with fairly high overall loud volume in conclusion can i recommend this machine 
Yes, but only to certain people. First of all, you gotta keep in mind that there are a lot of laptops out there that now have an RTX 2070 and cost significantly less, like around $1,500, you should be able to get an RTX 2070. Now, probably not a super version of it, but an RTX 2070 is like, only five to 10% slower than the super version anyway, so it's a really small downgrade for only $500 difference in price. Now, the two main reasons to consider the Aura 17G, in my opinion, is the CNC aluminum chassis as well as the mechanical keyboard. If those two features really stand out to you, then I think the Aura 17G could be for you. But I mean, if you value saving more money, then I would probably go with like a uh, Asus ROG Strix G17 perhaps, or the Zephyrus G14, the HP Omen 15Z, all of those machines provide better bang for the buck because they have a cheaper price associated with very similar performance to this machine. Overall, I really like this machine, but its price is a little bit high for the performance that you're getting in my mind. If Aorus further reduces the price down, say about $1,900, $1,800, that's when I say, yeah, that's probably definitely worth the money and I can highly recommend it. So it's just gonna be a kind of per person individual taste. Like if you really love those two key features, then yeah, the Aura 17G is pretty great. So that's it for my review of the Aura 17G. If it was helpful, please smash that like button. And if you wanna see more of my laptop reviews and tech reviews in general, be sure to hit that notification bell and mark it to all. I will see you in the next one. Brandon, out. <laughs>